All right, we are on podcast number four, which is very cool. We have successfully made it through three yeah, <laughs> podcasts yeah. already. And I'm, I'm just thinking today how crazy busy we are. And uh, the, for the first three podcasts, I, I was like, you know, oh, my God, got to have everything perfect and right. And this one, I'm like, <laughs> oh, it's time, and I'm not even ready. So <laughs> as I was saying before we started recording, I forgot to even connect my camera. So <laughs> No, it's always funny how uh, kind of everything uh, everything shifts around. It, yeah, it felt well, like getting the show off the ground was just a huge amount of work. Um, but uh, if anything, now that we're ongoing and getting everything uh, a little bit more regular, it just feels like uh, uh, new challenges, but in a good way. It just means we've got a lot going on. Yeah, we do. We do. I, I'm thinking about all the meetings we've had the last couple of days. IWSCC is really rocking and I'm so excited. It's so great to see everything going on and the team just meshing so nicely, which is really good. Yeah, you've been all over the place too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, our, our, I guess the day on the hill that we did yesterday in uh, Parliament Hill in Ottawa. And now I'm at my mom's house in Renfrew. Yeah, Renfrew, shout out. Just uh, she's about 45 minutes north of Ottawa. So, so yes, it's kind of like one extreme to the other. I'm I'm presenting to a bunch of uh, elected officials and senators in in Ottawa, the Parliament Hill, and then the next day I'm hanging out in my mom's dining room <laughs> and having all my food and drink brought to me, which is very cool. It's nice to come home to mom. So, and I might see go see a few friends in in Renfrew tonight as well. So, and I'm so excited about our uh, veteran entrepreneur uh, research project because we have worked on this for quite some time. Yes. And, and Alex, you're newer with us, so you weren't there for the first round of work uh, that we did last year. And we're ready to pretty much <clears throat> release the questionnaire uh, in September. And then we had uh, the whole circumstance with Afghanistan. And with our stakeholder group being veterans, we knew that it really, and we had been advised that it really wasn't the best time to be releasing a survey when everything is going on and so many hearts are being wrenched by that horrific circumstance and their friends and, and, and you know, probably people they consider family uh, in, in such peril. The last thing we wanted to do was show up and say, hey, do you have a minute to fill in this survey? So, uh, and then of course the election came along. And, yeah. and <laughs> so we decided to, uh, to hold off on that. Uh, and then the next thing you know, it was pretty much uh, November, which is always busy for many uh, veterans. And we certainly didn't want to intrude on those particular ceremonies and all of the, the requirements for, uh, for veterans and those in the military. So, and then it was Christmas. And then we had a lot of staff off due to COVID. So here we are. And I love it because the, the goal has not changed. The goal remains. The timeline changed, but we're right back. And so next week we are releasing our questionnaire. And you may wonder what Project Vent is. Um, and it is a, a research project. It's pretty much a landmark research project in Canada about veteran entrepreneurs. So when I started this IWSCC, I was looking for statistics on veteran entrepreneurs and on disabled entrepreneurs. And there was so little of it. There was any, not much. Uh, post 2006 that was Canadian content. So I knew that when IWSCC got large enough and we had the staff in place and the funds that we would put together some research. And so that's what we're doing. And so this is going to be so cool because we don't know how many veteran entrepreneurs there are in Canada right now. We don't know where they're located. We don't know what their revenue base is like, what their size is like. I can guess that we've got some pretty fantastic veteran-owned businesses in Canada, just from the ones that I work with with IWSCC. Uh, but this is going to be just so cool. We're going to find out about their barriers to entrepreneurship, the obstacles that got in the way, how they overcame them, what resources did they use. Uh, and it's going to be really cool because we'll – we're going to be able to, to provide veterans in Canada at no cost to them all of this content, all of this information that we have, or we will be gleaning from them. So we're hoping to really get a lot of responses because, of course, the more people that respond to the to the survey, uh, the better understanding we have of, of veterans here in Canada. So, and you know, this information is going to go to our IWSCC corporate members because they. Um, They've been asking, how do we support veterans in our workplace and in our, uh, you know, in the public? And of course, I'm adding in the supply chain because for us, that's our focus. So, um, so yeah, so I think it's going to be very cool. Really excited to have you, Jamie. I'm going to sort of 
disappear behind the scenes now, but uh, really excited <laughs> to have you here for the episode today. You're going behind the coats behind yes. you, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, that's where they usually keep me. Uh, they just pull me out for these recording sessions and then put me back and when we're back in. Off you go. Well, it was uh, good having you out while you were It was here. nice to get some sun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. So thank you everyone for being here and for watching um, um, our show about basically all things supplier diversity and I and brought to you with our producer, which is remote video. And if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, you're going to see that we've got ASL captioning going on. And so that uh, has been provided um, by Maple Communications. And so we're really happy to be able to walk our talk and do business with our uh, diverse suppliers with IWSCC. Um, so my name is Deidre uh, uh, Guy, if you don't already know me, and, uh, and probably many of you don't. Um, and I am the president and the founder of the Inclusive Workplace and Supply Council of Canada, which we use the acronym IWSCC. We actively source businesses that are owned by veterans or people with disabilities, and we connect them, we certify them as a, an official diverse supplier, and we connect them with corporations and governments across Canada that are looking to do business with them and officially uh, add them to their supply chain. So it's actually very cool work that we do, and I'm always so happy to find new suppliers uh, that our corporate members would like to work with. And I'm super happy to have Jamie Crump here today. We've met, goodness, it's been a long time ago. I think you might have been with UPS when we first met. Um, so I think that's maybe about eight years. United. Or, United sorry, Rentals. Un yes, I'm sorry, yeah. United Rentals, not UPS. I apologize, United yeah. Rentals. So, so Jamie, uh, just to start off, do a little introduction introduction of yourself, please, and who are you, and, uh, and, and what do you do now? Uh, and then we'll talk a bit maybe about what you've done in the past, because it, it's extensive. Sure, Adri, thank you. Um, and I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my name's Jamie Crump, and my career began in procurement. That's really what my background is in. And uh, from that, I was always, um, well, you know, just doing something with supplier diversity. And in the beginning, it was uh, very much about coordinating with supplier diversity in companies that I worked for. Eventually, it became I was responsible for it. And then in a few companies, I actually started it from the ground up along with my procurement duties. So when I left corporate and started the Richwell Group, which is my company, and we consult in supply chain and in supplier diversity, um, then what I wanted to do is be able to take that background of sitting on both sides of the table, if you were, and be able to apply that both to um, starting successful programs and having them go on, as well as helping uh, small diverse owned businesses in terms of leveraging their certifications. So I work with companies in supply chain consulting, and that can be anything from building out a strategy or transformation from uh, participating on a specific bid or category expertise. Um, and then on the supplier diversity side, we work with corporates who are either building out uh, their strategy or perhaps they have one that's plateaued and they're trying to refresh or restart it. We have a lot of that going on right now. I also work with diverse owned businesses and leveraging their certification. So how can they use that to go out and uh, gain new business prospects and work with corporations to, uh, to get their goods and services? So you're working from both sides of the equation on this. Which I think is, it's very yeah. cool because yep. it really allows you <clears throat> to effectively inform both sides of the equation because you're hearing and experiencing both ends of it. So that's a, an excellent way to do it. Um, it does, yeah. What, uh, what, like take us back to back in the day, because I know you were in procurement, but not necessarily supplier diversity back in the day. And so where did supplier diversity sort of come into your field of view and what made you choose to move over? And I guess it's not really over, but alongside and focus more on supplier diversity than, than straight on procurement. Well, you know, I was working for a bank in the Detroit area and uh, my boss came in one day and he said, uh, Ford and GM came in today and did a presentation together. And for those of you who didn't grow up in Michigan, where automotive is, that's not usually how it happens. Oh, yeah. Good so point. Yeah. I said, really? And he said, yes, yes, it's true. And he said, and uh, they have this thing called supplier diversity. And if we don't get on board, we may start losing some deposits. So he threw the deck on my desk and said, 
take a look at it. Tell me what you're going to need and, you know, make us proud. So that was my, uh, that was my So it wasn't really a choice for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't, but, uh, you know, at, at that time too, understand, I was like, um, I got my first procurement role in terms of leadership um, at the age of 19. Oh, wow. And I was working for a welding and medical supply. Uh, so I was the, I was the only female for like a thousand miles. And, um, and I'd love to tell you that I was some sort of phenom. Um, but really it was kind of one of those situations you've seen the footage where the building collapses and there's like one person left in there, you know, brushing off a little dust and that's all that happens to them. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of what happened to me. Um, I mean, I knew what I was doing per se, but I was kind of the survivor of a reshuffle okay. that took place within an organization. And I ended up with the procurement group. And so uh, then I got them to send me to school uh, <laughs> to learn a little bit about what it was I was supposed to be doing. And, uh, and they agreed. But I really, I had been helping the head of procurement prior to this, um, and I really enjoyed it. I really kind of had a knack for it, and I, I liked the negotiations. I liked the fact that it was something different all the time, um, and so I ended up really just kind of sticking with it. And most of the procurement that I've done has been what they call indirect, so it's not what you're manufacturing. It's all of the infrastructure that supports okay. the business. And I really enjoyed that because it was so different. But I also liked that it didn't tie you to one particular industry. It made you very portable uh, <laughs> when it came time to looking for other opportunities. I was just going to say, for me, I, I didn't pay much attention to supply chain prior to getting involved in this type of work. I mean, I understood that they existed but I never really thought about where does people's toilet paper and pens come from. They just order it from where have, where have you. But large enough organizations, that's a huge consideration. And, and so this is something I think that often suppliers don't necessarily yeah. recognize that, you know, on top of this person selling whatever it is they happen to manufacture and perhaps needing you to feed that type of, um, of goods that they provide, there are all these other things that they are doing just simply to exist as an organization and they need to purchase things in order to do that. Uh, so and that's very cool. And that I love that because that was smart, even at that age, that, so that it didn't, you know, silo you into one type of experience of pro procurement you got to learn about all sorts of things and it made easily transferable skills it did i mean uh, obviously there were certain things that only went with the industry i mean i haven't bought bank vaults uh <laughs> or atm machines in a while but uh, <laughs> but they need a lot of the same things and so that allowed me to kind of jump around but you know as i started i was very often the only mm -hmm. female in the room. Um, I was almost always mm -hmm. the youngest in the room. Um, and so both of those were huge obstacles that needed to be overcome um, so that people, you know, would take me seriously and, um, and that I could get the job done for the company I was working for. So what year would it have been that you had this conversation with your manager about the two auto companies getting together and talking supplier diversity? Do you know offhand, roughly? Oh my, you're going to date I'm me sorry, now. I'm sorry, but I, I apologize. <laughs> but this would have... I just feel like it, it's so cool to have someone who's there <laughs> firsthand who is able to sort of share and also to get a feel for those of us in Canada, just how long supplier diversity has been a focus for large corporations and organizations in, in, in the States. No, that's fine. This would, have, this would have been the late 80s. Okay. Okay. So it was late 80s when I started that. And, um, you know, it had been going on mm -hmm. for a while with automotive, um, I came to learn, but they were really putting, making a push for it in terms of uh, making sure that everybody they did business with was on board. And that was one of the reasons why they were doing it together, because they knew that people were not accustomed to that. And they knew that it would garner attention and credibility, get them 
the level of people that they needed at the meetings, um, as well as making sure that something would happen. Um, you know, you don't, you don't come from the Detroit area and not take it seriously when Jim and Ford both are asking <laughs> together. <laughs> so, and, and we hear, we hear often the banks, uh, the supplier diversity champions will comment from the banks that the only time they all get in the same room is in the, and, and agree is, and work together is in the supplier diversity world, which I think is a testament to uh, the support system that's in place for supplier diversity, both suppliers and corporates uh, here in Canada, and I'm sure it's much the same in the states. That's a fair statement. Yeah, I don't think um, I don't think I've seen it any other time, <laughs> except at the. And that's true for a lot of different industries. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The more I spend time uh, in this world, the more I see that that cooperation, um, and also between different governments and parts of the government. Um, it's, it's great. It's, it's, it's nice mm -hmm. to see that building. So our focus for this podcast and, and our entire theme for IWSCC for the month of May is on research. And I talked about this a bit prior to you coming on, um, mostly because we are releasing the questionnaire for our veteran uh, entrepreneur survey uh, for Canadian veteran entrepreneurs. And I know that you have participated in research on more than one occasion over the years. Um, and, and so I wanted to, you know, ask you a few questions about research in general and, 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 and sort of tap uh, from your expertise in that area. And so I want to start with why is research important in the first place? And I said this in our last podcast, most people hear the word research and, and they snooze because it's it's not the most exciting uh, topic. <laughs> that's I said that's when you get the best night's sleep is when someone's talking about research. But, but I know it's really important. So please share with us uh, why research is so important in your opinion. Absolutely. I mean, you know, research is the data that makes your next step credible. Um, because, you know, you and I could sit here and speculate on any given topic. And we would both have opinions about what may or may not be happening, what should or should not be happening, what people do or don't think about it. But we're really not going to know for certain until we go out and do research. Um, you know, and I mean, we learned that, you know, we learned this early on. If you, you know, when I was when I was a child, we used to get the little Nielsen rating book, right? They would send it out to people and you would keep it for a week uh, <laughs> on what you were watching and send it back in. Um, and, you know, that was research because they wanted to see what people were paying attention to. Um, and, you know, thankfully now it's a lot easier to come by. Um, than it used to be because of technology. So you can go out and get this data. But, you know, I depend, my company now depends incredibly on research because I'm supporting a lot of different categories. If I was trying to go out and interview people and find out what was going on and what the numbers were in this or that or the other, um, you know, I just, I couldn't have the scope that my company has today. Yes, uh, I, I totally agree. And I think that, um, I love that the first line that you said, I think that that really encapsulates the importance of research. You know, I, I was astounded when I discovered that there was no real research on veteran business owners in Canada and, and not much more on disabled business owners in Canada. Why do you think that is? Do you have any thoughts on that? And, and why do some things get researched and other things do not? Well, you know, that's a great question. And I think that some things I think get researched because they're kind of front and center in, um, you know, in, in the country or the population's mind. So you see things that kind of ebb and flow in terms of how much it's being researched, how much people are talking about it. People are talking about it, it's probably getting, re you know, there's going to be research that's going to be done on it. So I think in some cases, it's a situation where if people aren't talking about it, um, then there's not necessarily a lot of research that's going on behind it to support it. And I think that's what happens in a lot of cases with some of the supplier diversity stuff. Either people aren't thinking about it, or in some cases, they don't really want to know exactly what's going on. Um, because, you know, once you have the data, um, then you need to do something about it. 
And so I think uh, certainly in some cases, it's a situation where people either aren't ready to address it or they don't want to address it. And so why go research it um, if, I, if I don't feel like I have the bandwidth to deal with it right now? Um, then it's easy to kind of keep falling down on the list of the next things to do. And I think that's why some things uh, don't see the amount of research or data that they really should be, um, because there's just not somebody out there um, carrying it forward. Yeah, I, I guess there's no real sort of Canadian research body that you can go to and say, okay, we want this research to go to it. It, it all has to be up to individual organizations such as, as IWSCC. Uh, I know that the other supply councils have done a fair amount of research on their own regarding their own constituents. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's sad that this type of thing has to be done and, and, the, and these organizations have to essentially foot the bill on this. But it's also extremely important information that they're gleaning every time. The, the pandemic also brought that supplier diversity conversation forward. In our experience, anyway, would you say the same thing happened in your experience? Ab absolutely. You know, I said I spent most of my career in, in supply chain and supplier diversity. And a lot, a large portion of that time was spent trying to get people <laughs> to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> and lo and behold, the pandemic arises. And the two things that I've tried to get, you know, conversations going on are now like front and center in the news. So between the supply chain impact uh, that came about, everybody's looking at their supply chain now. Everybody's reevaluating their supply chain strategies. And then, you know, with things like the, the mm -hmm. George Floyd killing and, and different things of that nature have brought diversity to the forefront um, globally, not just in the States, but, um, you know, on a global basis. And so in both of those cases now, you have um, the amount of research that I have been able to read and see in the last two years is probably more than I saw in the previous five to 10 years before that. Wow. I'm curious, and this is a, a little bit off the research topic, but you have such a breadth of, of experience in supplier diversity what other countries are, are running supplier diversity programs that you've run into and who would you say is doing a, job, a particularly good job or, or maybe something that's a little different than what we do here in Canada or the States? Do you, are there countries, other countries that you know of that are doing that? Oh, yeah, there are. I have clients in the UK. I have clients in the European Union. Um, I've had some clients in Australia. Um, Italy is, is doing some work. Uh, Germany has. Uh, France. Uh, certainly is. Um, so it really has more to do, I think, mm. with the company, uh, regardless of where they're based, who their, um, who their customer base is. So if they're selling to other companies, if it's B2B, then in, in a lot of cases, their customers mm. are pushing them into that because they want to know things like tier two spend. And they also want to know answers to the questions about what are you doing? Um, some of the most, some most of the work that I do often entails working mm -hmm. with sales organizations of companies, and that's helping them to de develop sales collateral to respond to RFPs, to respond to these questions mm -hmm. that are coming in about what are you doing. Um, if they're not B two B, if they're B two C, mm. it's even stronger right now because as we're seeing, millennials and Gen Zers just expect that the companies that they do business with or the companies that they work for are going to support this. And with the advent of social media, it's more on, uh, there's more of an onus on companies to say where they stand. Um, you know, 10 years ago, companies never talked about it because it was, they never talked about anything mm -hmm. that wasn't around their product or service because, you know, you don't want to make somebody angry or, you know, why do we get into that? So it was just no comment, no comment, no comment. Now, if they're not talking about it, that's raising the question of what's what's wrong with your company? What are you doing? Um, and as we've seen with the with the younger generations, they're not willing to work for companies that aren't in support of that. So it's also, you know, where everybody's experiencing the talent situation and it's difficult to recruit and retain talent. And they have no interest in working for companies that don't support this. And if they do join a company and they find that it's just lip service, they'll move on. They move on a lot quicker than, you know, my generation did. It makes me really proud, actually, 
to think about that, to think about the generations behind us. I mean, they didn't just get this out of nowhere. <laughs> We're not so great at it in our generation, but but we have at least now, opened up the doors and taught them a little something that's allowed them to go, yes, this is great. We want these these socially responsible organizations in our lives, and those are the ones we're going to support. So I think that's 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 great. I mean, it, it, it gives us, it gives me hope, I guess, is what I'm saying. So, yeah. It gives me, yeah, absolutely, it gives me hope. And I think it's one of the pluses of social media. You hear a lot of how awful it is and what it's done to us. But one of the things that has done is it's, it's making companies accountable. Um, you know, because now it's much easier for me to see how a company spends its money, how a company operates its own organization. Um, you know, 10 years ago, if, if two guys had been arrested and taken out of a Starbucks, nobody would have known it. Um, you know, now it goes viral on, you know, video and the whole company yeah. shuts down for two days to, do, <laughs> to fix it, you know, DNI training. So it really is having an impact and it really does help, um, you know, people who are interested in knowing it's very easy for them to find out now. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah, it has its pros and cons. Um, I'm going to just try and look at it from the pros from now on. Thank you for giving me a couple of extra to, <laughs> to retain. <laughs> so um, I've sent you this list of questions prior to, uh, to today. These aren't a surprise to you. And one of the ones that I asked you that probably made you giggle, I'm not sure. But the question about how do we make research sexy? How do we have people sort of not look at it like, oh my goodness, that's boring how do we how do we liven it up a little bit well you know some of us who are more <laughs> nerd than anything else you know have always found research pretty sexy because for me it was always about answers i mean what's really going on out there but i think you know in looking at it the real thing that you get from research is it gives empowerment um people are empowered because you don't have to speculate you don't have to guess you don't have to argue with somebody about whether or not your speculation is correct. Um, you've got the data now to support it. Um, people are now looking, I did a session uh, about a month ago for a company on how do you evaluate research? So, you know, is it just data that's being spewed from someplace or how does it come about and how do you evaluate what's good research versus research mm -hmm. that's really skewed towards a certain result or, you know, something of that nature. But I think that, you know, there's something very empowering about having research data um, to back up what you're doing. And it also makes it, I think, a lot easier to sell both internally as well as externally. You know, it's, it's a lot easier for a company to go get funding for something that they want to do if they have hard, credible data to support it. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of different ways that research and the data that is created by it um, is both interesting and it's also very empowering because it puts the tools in your hands to take whatever it is your dream is to the next step. And, and that really ties in with the answer from our last guest uh, who works for a GR firm and so is talking about how research impacts government decision making. And so I asked him the same question and he said essentially to attach it to a goal. And when the research allows you to accomplish the goal, accomplishing goals is sexy. And so I think what you're saying just ties in beautifully with that. So thank you for that. You know, this is yeah. this is uh, a little bit outside of certainly out of the questions that, that I asked you. but so many people say, oh, I researched that. Oh, I'm I, I, I know all the information because I researched that. Can you just take a minute or so and just go through the phases of an actual research project? Like what is actual, what does actual research look like in terms of the amount of work involved and the steps that you have to take to come up with uh, effective and reliable answers? Oh my. Well, you know, I mean, depending on what you're researching and how, and, and, you know, what you're doing it for. There's going to be different steps. Now, I, I used to have the procurement group that did research and development for the telephone company. And so we were looking at, you know, where's our customer service levels and what do people want to see, but also what do they want next generation um, in terms of services. I also worked for a pharmaceutical company and we did clinical trials. Very different type of research. 
and that you're looking at, you're taking this and you're applying it to different things. But at the basis, there's a lot of it that is exactly the same. And in that, what I found the similarities were was that uh, you have to make sure that you're doing it in a way that's not steering you towards a solution, right? Um, you know, we all hear about the questions that you can answer when you're doing surveys, right? You don't want something, you know, I can ask you, you know, do you think, uh, do you think that war is a bad thing, <laughs> Right. And then, well, well, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. So she's completely anti-war. She's, you know, she doesn't want to take care of our shores and keep us safe. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's that kind of research, right. But it's also about making sure that your group that you're taking the research from also is representative and diverse. So, you know, if you think about pharmaceuticals, for example, um, if they're doing clinical trials and they're doing them all in an all-white neighborhood, then there's a lot of things that we're not going to learn about that drug in terms of how it operates with different ethnicities who have different medical drivers or even who have, you know, you're certainly not, it's not going to have mm -hmm. any impact on sickle cell anemia yeah. at all, is it? According to the research, because you didn't research anybody who could possibly have it. So, you know, I think that when you're looking at any research, whether it's the news or what have you, it's, you know, what is your source? Where's it coming from? Mm -hmm. um, what do they have to gain by it? Who paid for it is always huge. Um, and, you know, and then not just the chart that they show you at the end, but, well, how did you get to the numbers of that chart? What were the questions that were asked and how was that evaluated? Uh, because it is, it's kind of a slippery slope and you can take a lot of statistics and really make it work to your mm -hmm. advantage. Well, and no we, matter yeah, what the result we, was, <laughs> if you're, if you're crafty. We do see that all right? the time. Well, thank you for that clarification. That's, uh, that's some pretty important points as it, as it relates to research. I'd love for you to share with me the research uh, that you were involved in that you felt was the most impactful out of all the projects that you've been included in. Well, you know, I mean, the, the pharmaceutical was pretty darn impactful because you're talking about mm. the potential of bringing new drugs onto the scene and um, things that are treating, um, you know, things that maybe aren't treatable now. Um, so, you know, I'd spent my whole career of, you know, somebody would turn around finally and say, well, you know, we're not curing cancer here. Well, <laughs> you know, but what, what do you say when you are <laughs> trying to do that? So I think certainly that was some of the most impactful uh, that I've had. But aside from that, I would say, um, you know, information, research that I've been a part of where we've gone in and looked at different areas, uh, different diversity uh, groups, and looking at not just the economic, economic impact now, um, but how long does it take to get to a parity level? Um, and that was a mm -hmm. big breakthrough, I think, for me personally, um, was an understanding. Intuitively, I knew, you know, you can't just draw a line in the sand and say, okay, as of today, you're equal. No. Because you're not. You know, even even if we waved the magic wand and said, as of today, all women are going to make as much as men. <laughs> OK, um, that still does not put them in play for the next promotion against men. It still does not give them the capital access of men. So there are all these other factors that come in. And I think that type of research has been the most fascinating for me, the most telling for me. Um, and really shows how much work we have left to do. Yes, it can be overwhelming at times, I'm sure. And probably in, in your shoes, you would have be that much more close to that. It's, it's interesting because, you know, I mean, I grew up, I'm, I'm from the South. I'm from in the States. I'm from Georgia. Um, but my family was a General Motors transplant. So my dad, we went to Michigan and my dad worked for GM. So it was this back and forth. I grew up going back and forth between these two worlds that were very, very different um, in, in my time frame. 
and and still is in a lot of cases. Um, so looking at that, the back and forth of it, you know, my parents were teaching me everybody should get treated the same. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I would question that when I didn't see it. <laughs> and I questioned it a lot more in the South than I, than I did in the North. Um, <laughs> and I didn't care who was around when I asked the question, you know, and, and my parents who weren't particularly political, but they were very invested in, you know, me taking those beliefs forward. Um, so, you know, to their credit, they always oh, stopped fantastic. and had the conversation, yeah. uh, <laughs> no matter when and where. Um, but yeah. yeah, but I, I think that, um, that gives you this partly, you know, I mean, I'm living today on land that was taken away from the Cherokee in, in the removal in the trail of tears. Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's definitely a debt there, um, that's owed and you have to be cognizant of that, I think. Um, and I think it's experiential certainly gives you a familiarity with that. I certainly can't walk in anybody else's shoes. Um, but if I put myself in a position to experience or discuss or learn as much about it as I can, um, then I'm certainly better off than setting by and saying, well, we don't need to research that because, you know, that's old news. That's not a problem anymore um, because it doesn't happen to be for somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like <clears throat> I feel like I can talk to you for quite a lot longer than we have here today. So we'll have to next time you're in Canada, maybe get together. Um, and I do want to keep us on topic, but I am loving where this is going. So I'm, I'm torn, but I did yeah. want to ask if you had, uh, research projects that you were, maybe they didn't go as well as you'd hoped, whether the results weren't what you thought or the process itself didn't go, or maybe, or perhaps there's one that you were kind of surprised by the results. Is there any of those experiences for you? Yeah, I think, you know, the ones that I, that I weren't, that I wasn't so happy about, I think were those that I felt um, didn't go look at all of the diverse possibilities um, that they were looking at a particular group or they were looking for a particular answer or they were looking to give mm. credibility to an answer they'd already thought they reached. Um, those types of situations, um, you know, it's a lot of, there's a lot of work and effort that goes into it, not just for the people doing the research, but also the people who are participating in it as well. And I just feel like it's so unfair if you don't take that and, and do all of the right things with it. So that's been disappointing. Um, I get surprised by research all the time. <laughs> and I don't know if that means I'm a bad guesser or what the situation is. But there's, there's rarely, you know, a, a good, a good cross section of research. Um, there's usually something in there that will surprise me. Um, so let's see examples. Um, you know, I, I was looking at some research last week for a project that I'm working on. And it was about doing business with LGBTQ businesses. And it said in there, it was one of these where it was like they had talked to all these different companies um, that had supplier diversity programs and how many of them had um, LGBTQ as part of their supplier diversity. And it was like 87 percent of the companies. And I thought, wow, that's great. Well, then later on in the research, you know, six pages or eight pages down was what were the breakouts and so, you know, it was this percent for women and this percent for minorities, 0.03% wow. for LGBTQ. Now, that to me is a huge gap that needs to be addressed. If we've got 87% of wrong. these companies out looking for it, <laughs> and they're only generating 0.03% of return. Um, you know, somebody, somebody, somebody needs my help. That was the message to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> so I, I have another question for you, but I am cognizant of our time. 
And so I'm going to simplify it a little bit. And, and, <laughs> and so for people that are listening and, and someone says to them, hey, can you fill in this research survey? So many of us go, oh, how long is it going to take? Uh, you know what, never mind. What, what advice would you give to people? What, what would you say to folks who are not sure if they'd like to, to participate in research and, and actually take the time to do a survey? What would you suggest? You know, my rule of thumb is if, if, I'm, suggest, if I'm interested in the results, I participate. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's fair for me to look at research and go, well, I was really excited about this, but it doesn't have this and it doesn't have that and it doesn't have so-and-so. If you're interested, it's kind of like voting, you know, um, or my grandmother used to say about letters, you know, when I'd say, <laughs> why don't you write me? And she'd say, you have to write them to get them, sweetie. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think if you're interested in results, you need to participate in the process. Um, if you're not interested or if it's not something that you are particularly knowledgeable mm. about, then maybe the best thing to do is to pass. Uh, because you may be skewing actual results that are out there if you're trying to kind of make it up as you go along. Um, but I think if you're really interested in it, then I, you know, I participate. I'll take the time. I probably do, you know, I probably do three or four surveys a week. That's that's excellent. That's uh, I, I feel like I should send you our survey, but you're not a veteran and, <laughs> and you're not in Canada. But <laughs> but I'm like, OK, one more person participating. So, so listen, Jamie, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I, I totally enjoyed it. I knew that I would, and I really appreciate you taking the time out. I know you're busy and extremely well sought after. Uh, so I just think that the fact that you came on, I'm honored that you came on to our IWSCC podcast episode. I think this will be episode four that will be released. So it's early on in the process. So thank you so much for being here. No, thank you for having me. And, you know, um, I'm very committed on disabled and veteran uh, works and I do plenty of work in Canada. So I have a vested interest in that as well. So um, I wish you all the best. And if we can help any way we can help you, just let us know. Fantastic. <clears throat> Alex, uh, jot that down. <laughs> Make sure get uh, get Jamie's number on on speed dial for us. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah and, it's, and it's on video she's committed oh. so i mean that's, yeah <laughs> okay thank you again jamie and and thank you everyone else for for being here today uh, for more supplier diversity content check us out at iwscc.ca uh, or on youtube or listen to it on your favorite podcast you'll be able to uh podcast platform you'll be able to hear us there um there's new episodes we try to get them out every second Thursday. Sometimes we have some timing hiccups, but that's okay. We'll we get them out the next day. The, the goal stays the same. Sometimes the timing changes. Uh, so we have a lot more going on too with IWSCC. So be sure to check out all of our social media for all the updates. Thank you again for being here and have a fantastic day. Thank you.